Welcome to the Watering Hole Podcast. I'm your host, Mary Riemann. The Watering Hole is a place to come and quench your thirst for meaning, nourish your hunger for inspiration, and feed your need for connection. Featuring inspirational talks, curious conversations, mystical meditations, and other artistic expressions exploring themes on life, spirituality, nature, mystery, and so much more. So meet me at the watering hole, and together, let's drink from deep waters. Technology makes it seem that greater connection is possible, and it is. But how many of us now have to tend to more relationships with less depth? And where do we take the time and energy to tend to the relationships that would have in times past been on the periphery of our attention? It's pulled from family dinners, walks in the park, and intimate conversations. And because there is a persistent threat of frequent momentary interruptions by a ringer, an alarm, or some notification, nearly every potentially intimate moment can be disrupted. That impacts our relationships and our experience of intimacy. When we know that our heart-to-heart talk can be interrupted, it adds a dimension of tentativeness. We might not know exactly when an interruption will occur, but because it's likely, we might hold ourselves back not wanting to get into the depth or the details if there's a possibility of being uh, interrupted or even put on hold. Even if the disturbance is as brief as reading a short text or checking to see who's calling, it's still an intrusion into the sacred space of sharing our hearts. If, if an accident, if a car accident can occur because we take a moment to go like this, think about the misunderstandings that can occur when we're trying to have an authentic conversation and your phone rings and you look away. Think about what we might miss. Intimacy requires a protected space, times dedicated to undivided attention. So many of our relationships wither from lack of attention. Our bodies might be present, but we're somewhere else entirely. Lost in thought, self-consumed with our own pain or dissatisfaction with other people or with the world at large. We might even be consumed with our own success, so much to the point that we're never fully present. So. I say this a lot here, and I will continue to say it. Move away from the screen, put your phones down, turn off the news. So many of us are addicted to the news. Turn off the news and bring your attention to this moment. You know, I, like you, sometimes fall out of my spiritual practice, and I go through times when I meditate and times when I don't, or when my meditation um, feels not fruitful at all, but that's the nature of meditation sometimes. Um, but I, I, I'm getting back into my practice and I'm always astounded at when I take that time to meditate, to have undivided attention, uh, to be with myself. Uh, I'm always astounded at how easy it is to get distracted and how full the moment is when we really give into it. I mean, when we're really present in the moment, like all the divisions disappear and we expand ourselves so much to contain what's happening in this moment everywhere, everywhere, from out there in the cosmos to in here in the dynamics of our bodily functions and fluids. It expands us to see that we are one with it all, that there is no separation. But intimacy does require that protected space. And we're not very good at at doing that. 
as Meister Eckhart says, the most important hour is always the present. The most significant person is precisely the one you're sitting across from. The most necessary work is always love. All of us need intimacy, and I think we all desire it. As unique as we all are, an awful lot of us want the same things. We want to shake up our currently less than fulfilling lives. We want to be happier, move more loving, forgiving, and connected with the people around us. You know, we're hardwired for connection, for belonging, for being loved and loving. And intimacy is the heat or the energy released by that connection. But here's the thing. We can want it so badly that we try to hotwire it. And we confuse intensity for intimacy, obsession for caring, and control for security. If, as our author says, all real living is meeting, the cultivation of intimacy requires ongoing courtship, right? Getting acquainted and reacquainted with ourselves and with each other getting close to one another and trying gently, patiently, and respectfully to discover what they love, what the people in our life love. And this process is as essential for single people as it is married people. And it's as needed by old people as much as young people. When our need for intimacy goes unmet, we don't t tend to function very well. We isolate, we ache, we numb, we hurt others. Intimacy is as much something we need to cultivate with ourselves as we do with other people. In fact, there's a direct relationship between the intimacy we have with ourselves and the intimacy we share with others. If we don't know ourselves, how can we share ourselves? The Buddha said, you yourself, as much as anybody, deserve your love and affection. You yourself, as much as anybody, deserve your love and affection. Cultivating intimacy with oneself comes from learning to be at home in oneself, accepting ourselves as we are, forgiving ourselves, and becoming comfortable in our own skin. This too is a courtship, right? It's like we've got to be able to have dates with ourselves. I, uh, I officiated my niece's wedding this summer and um, she and her now husband talked to me about how they have dates for themselves and they call it Daniel time and Anna time. You know, we've got to be able to pursue those things that interest us those things that inspire us, those things that make us feel alive because that's how we expand and grow and change so that when we come home, our partner or our friend can ask us what we did or how our day was and we can actually have something to share with them of meaning, of meaning. When we are at home with ourselves, we're able to be alone without feeling lonely because there's an underlying sense of well-being, a certainty that we are loved and lovable, of being held and connected with a larger reality, whether that is family, tribe, spiritual community, or life itself. Intimacy. An awareness and feeling of connection is the aim of the spiritual life. It's the whole thing, people. It is to awaken to the awareness of just how interwoven, how knitted into reality in all of its expressions we actually are. And it arises from nurturing our kinship with all that is. This is why Matthew Fox, my teacher, calls creation spirituality a befriending spirituality because it calls us into courtship with life, with nature, with self and others in order to deepen our awareness of our relationship with this 
thing we call life, this adventure that we call life. And courtship is the path to intimacy. Think about how you feel and what you do when you're courting someone. And that could be a partner or a friend, a lover. Think about what you do. You go out of your way to listen to them, to find out what matters to them. You go out of your way to surprise them, to bring them little gifts, to let them know you're thinking about them. Why do we stop doing it when we sign the marriage license? Whoa! Many of our relationships suffer from lack of intimacy because we've stopped the courting process. And if you think it doesn't happen in friendships, then you, it happens. <laughs> I fall in love with people. I fall in love with people. And when I feel attracted to someone, you're damn right. I'm going to invite them to coffee or to a beer because I want to have a conversation. I want to know what's going on. That's the beginning of intimacy. And we need to do it more. Uh, there's a, a writer, she goes by the name of Sark, and her, her advice is invite someone dangerous to tea. <laughs> right? Someone you might not otherwise invite. Someone who might challenge your own ways of thinking. Someone who might call you into a greater way, expression of love and well-being. Mother Teresa suggested that the greatest suffering is to feel alone, unwanted, and unloved. I think we're living in a time where there is an epidemic of loneliness, right? We see it all around us. We know it ourselves because we feel it at times. And I think it comes because we have a lack of intimacy, because we feel disconnected from our inner being, from other people, from nature, from meaning, from meaning. And this epidemic goes hand in hand with the culture of fear. Fear is the great enemy of intimacy. It makes us run away from each other or it makes us cling to each other but it certainly does not create true intimacy. And fear is being served up to us at every turn. We're taught to be afraid of other people. We're taught to fear difference, to fear being attacked, to fear rejection, to fear failure, to fear, to fear, to fear, to fear. That's another reason we come here, to abate our fears, to remember that we can connect, that we do have a net that will catch us when we do fail when we are rejected, when we have been attacked, so that we can reground ourselves in that spark of the divine that is not affected by any of that, that cannot be touched by those things. If intimacy comes from befriending, then friendship itself may be an antidote to loneliness, the medicine we need to awaken, the means to deepening our connections and cultivating courage. This may be why mystics and saints in every tradition have modeled sacred friendships throughout history. Such friendships have proven to be an entrance into intimacy, not just with other people, but with the divine, with life in the fullest sense. In the Hebrew tradition, Moses had Aaron. Ruth had Naomi. In Christianity, not only were the disciples sent out in twos, but some of the saints had significant and formative friendships. Francis of Assisi had Claire. Francis de Sales had Jean de Chantel. In Islam, Rumi had Shams of Tabriz. In Celtic spirituality, sacred friendships are seen as so integral to soul development that the concept of Anamkara, soul friendship is widely accepted and encouraged. As I thought about Anamkara, if you don't know what it is, I absolutely suggest John O'Donohue's book by that name, Anamkara. He, he, he's deceased now, but his writing is poetic from the first word to the last. It's amazing. Um, I was thinking about this though. 
I think in some ways we've lost this in our culture, this appreciation for soul friendships. And we focus so much on marriage that we've projected the false idea that we can get all our needs met by one person. And that's just not true. We need a village. We need community. And we need intimacy with more than just our spouse. It's an important part of being whole and full. So make no mistake about it. I absolutely hold hands with more people than just my wife. I absolutely hug more people than just my wife. I absolutely have more uh, in-depth conversations with people than just my wife. And it makes me more multifaceted, which helps me shine a little bit more when I come home and gives her something to be interested in. And the same is true for her. You know, my girl had a major transformation in this last year. I don't know what the hell was going on in her her natal chart, but something happened. (laughs) And uh, she's had a major transformation. And in many ways, she's not the person I married. And thank God, right? Because she's new again. And her explorations and interests now get shared with me. And that keeps us It keeps our romance alive. It keeps the courtship alive. When I started, oops, I'll come back to that. When I started Tree of Life, I started with a group who came from St. Agnes. And this guy, Chris Kendall, came from St. Agnes. And Chris lived in a group home um, on the west side of Dayton and uh, it was a group home for development, developmentally disabled people. And Chris and I became good friends. We danced together a lot. He danced. Chris would dance through the neighborhood. I'd look up in my office, and I'd just see Chris with his headphones on, <laughs> dancing through the neighborhood. And I believe that his dances affected that neighborhood because I wasn't the only one seeing them. And, and he, he had a way of raising spirits. Uh, he, he died tragically. Um, He had a seizure and the group home didn't send his medication with him on a trip. And he had a seizure and died um, when he was about 30. But uh, Chris at Tree Talk one day, which is uh, what we do after our service, referred to all of us at Tree of Life as his God friends. And I I love that, right? Because that's Anamkara. It's, It's soul friends. It's this idea that we can actually be here for each other. And for Chris... We were his family. He had no family. His family dropped him off. Never saw him again. And he'd been at that group home since he was in his teens and probably a group home prior to that in Indiana. They transferred him here. His family never came to visit him. When he died, there was no family except us. He honored us by letting us be his family. But he taught us so much about intimacy, right? The thing about Chris was, I mean, Chris would ask you how you were doing, but you weren't going to get into a conversation about the nuts and bolts of your, of your work or the practicalities of something, right? He had a very, very uh, active imagination and lived there a lot of the time. So it wasn't personal per se. It wasn't like, hey, Keisha, how are you doing today? And how's your mom? And it wasn't like that, but it was, it was a pure opening where actually the personal didn't get in the way of the soul. And so when we were in relationship with Chris, you were in relationship with the divine and you had to roll with it. There was no other way to do it, but to roll with it. I think Chris knew that intimacy, whether it comes in deep friendships or family relationships or through spiritual community, saves us. It saves us from our own smallness and sense of isolation. Sacred friendships provide an arena in which each participant can safely explore the depths of self, other, and the meaning of life while contemplating and celebrating how the love shared between them is an expression, a mirror even, of their relationship with the divine. 
And that's why I love this poem by Hafez. It happens all the time in heaven, and some say it will begin to happen again on earth, that men and women who are married and men and men who are lovers and women and women who give each other light often will get down on their knees and while so tenderly holding their love, lover's hand, with tears in their eyes will sincerely speak, saying, my dear, how can I be more loving to you? How can I be more kind? Just ask your friends that this week. My dear, how can I be more loving to you? How can I be more kind? Ask your partner that this week and see how it changes things. Ask yourself that this week and then do what you need to do to be more kind and loving to yourself. Because as John O'Donohue said, without the blessing of friendship, we would never have become who we are. In the climate of love and understanding that friendship provides, we take root and blossom into full human beings. Our friends are, mirror, are the mirrors where we recognize ourselves, and quite often it is their generosity of spirit that has enabled us to grow and flourish. Friends open us to new worlds and invite us in. They carry their burdens they carry our burdens in their hearts and give us the wisdom of distance to deal with them. They point us toward authentic development, illuminate the dark, and remain steadfast in their support when we need it the most. The sacred intimacy shared in friendship is what distinguishes those who walk with us on the surface of life from those who follow us into the depths of it. The power and connection experienced in intimate encounters and sacred friendships may be the most powerful force of transformation available to us and our world. That's why community is so important. It is the practice ground. It is a playing field. It is the court where we can become Anamkara for each other. where we can cultivate intimacy. And these relationships can draw us into a love affair with life. Think about how things would change if we were in love with life. It changes everything. Just call to mind when you fell in love or when you've fallen in love. It changes everything. You go to work with a lighter step. You do your hobbies with more gusto. You bring yourself wholly and completely to the person you want to be sharing with. This is the work of reconnection, and this is the work that weaves the world together. It's the work that can actually not only remind us we are one, but give us a sense, a feeling that we are one. Thanks for listening, everybody. I look forward to meeting you right back here at the watering hole. And as Mary Oliver said, go easy, be filled with light, and shine.